This video is going to be about the equipartition theorem, and if you want to understand the equipartition theorem, you also have to understand another important concept, degrees of freedom, which we'll also talk about here. Let's start by going back to the previous video in this lecture series, where I used the microscopic model of an ideal gas to come up with an equation for the average kinetic energy of an ideal gas molecule, which is given by 3 over 2 times the Boltzmann constant K times the absolute temperature T. But how did I derive this equation? Well, I first derived the kinetic energy in the x, y, and z directions, which turned out to be half kT each, and then I added them all together, so I got 3 times half kT, or 3 over 2 kT. You can see here that each direction of motion added another half kT to my total kinetic energy amount. Now, in general, if we look at total thermal energy instead of just kinetic energy, we can see that the more quote-unquote directions of motion you have, the larger your total thermal energy. And just like with our kinetic energy example for the ideal gas, the total thermal energy also increases by half kT for each quote-unquote direction of motion you add. So if F is the total number of possible directions of motion of a molecule, the total thermal energy of that molecule is half kT times F. Note here that I'm being careful to use quotes with the word direction, but in general, the higher the number F, the more free your molecule is to move around. That's why F is known as the number of degrees of freedom. For example, if we have a molecule confined to move in one dimension, the molecule has only one degree of freedom and is less free to move around compared to a molecule that can move in three-dimensional space, which would have three translational degrees of freedom. But counting the number of degrees of freedom for a molecule can be pretty subjective if we use the quote-unquote number of directions it can travel as an estimate of f. So is there a more formal, exact definition of f? There is. More formally, a molecule has a degree of freedom for each quadratic energy it possesses. A quadratic energy just means an energy quantity which depends on the molecule's velocity or position in a quadratic manner. So for instance, translational kinetic energy, half mv squared, rotational kinetic energy, half i times omega squared, omega here is the angular velocity, and elastic potential energy, half kx squared, they're all quadratic energies. And for each axis in which they apply, they correspond to a degree of freedom. Now the concept that the average energy of any degree of freedom is half kT is an important result in statistical mechanics. It's called the equipartition theorem. We'll prove this later on in our series. But in general, using the equipartition theorem, the average total thermal energy for a system with capital N molecules and F degrees of freedom per molecule is N times F times half kT. Now, there's two caveats behind this discussion so far. The first is that the total thermal energy isn't the total energy overall of your system. There's other things like molecular rest energy, so mc squared, and chemical potential energy that aren't included. This is just the thermal energy, so the energy that only changes in response to changes in temperature, without counting phase transitions. The other caveat is that it's not always easy to count the degrees of freedom of a molecule. You need to learn how to count by practice. So let's cover a couple of examples. We'll start with a diatomic oxygen, or O2, just hanging out in a three-dimensional space. Here's what it looks like at a molecular level, one atom attached to another with a double bond. This oxygen has three degrees of translational freedom. Its center of mass can move freely in the x, y, and z directions. It also has two rotational degrees of freedom, so it can rotate around the x-axis and it can rotate around the y-axis. Rotation around the z-axis, or the axis corresponding to the length of the molecule, doesn't count, mainly because of quantum mechanics, which we'll explain later on in this series. So that gives you two rotational degrees of freedom. On the other hand, if you had a nonlinear molecule like water or ammonia, then you'd have three rotational degrees of freedom because there's no way to rotate around the length of this molecule since the molecule itself is non-linear. You can also have the oxygen atoms get closer and further from each other as though they're vibrating. Now, the oxygen atoms can only vibrate along one axis, but each axis of vibration corresponds to two degrees of freedom. One degree of freedom for vibrational kinetic energy and another for vibrational potential energy. Bear in mind, though, that vibrations don't become active until you reach higher temperatures. They're quote-unquote frozen out at lower temperatures. So at lower temperatures, your oxygen molecule is going to have 3 plus 2, so 5 degrees of freedom. But at higher temperatures, the vibrations get added on, so now you have 7 degrees of freedom.
If you've now got a solid, then you can think of a solid as a bunch of atoms connected to other atoms by springs in all directions, like in this bed spring model. Since each solid atom can vibrate in three different directions, each atom then has six degrees of freedom because you have a vibrational kinetic and vibrational potential component for each direction or each axis of vibration. So we've now briefly gone over the equipartition theorem and discussed the idea of degrees of freedom. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed this lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Han, signing out.